Hey everyone, it's uh, me again, Mr. Davitt. At this point, you've watched the presentations on our two limited war case studies, the Falklands War and the First Gulf War. You've completed the writing prompt uh, for those two wars. And now it's time to get into a little bit of a bulkier war, and this is the Chinese Civil War. Um, the, as opposed to the limited wars, there are big long-term causes at play here, which is making this uh, civil war happen. Um, so it'll take us a little bit more time to get through this. So in order to make it a little more manageable and pace yourself out, I've divided this into two parts. The first part is going to kind of give an overview of the causes, look a little bit at the fighting, um, and then we'll go into the second part, which we'll see kind of the conclusion of the fighting and the overall effects. So anyways, that's the way uh, this will kind of go. Remember, this is a civil war, and this is your first case study in civil wars. And remember, your second case study, the Russian Civil War, you'll be looking at um, through David Bullock's book or through the other research you do uh, where you're going to establish the overall causes, the fighting, and effects. Um, so that will cover case study number two for your civil wars. Um, in addition, regionally, this civil war is from Asia. So just in case you get a question... Um, on the exam that says you need to pick um, wars from different regions. We just want to remember uh, what regions we are. And remember, after you do this online module, you will have a war from every single of what we call the IB regions. Um, so this is in regards to Asia. Um, as we've done with the other wars, let's give some background and some overview on uh, what we're talking about when we get to the Chinese Civil War. So the Chinese Civil War has two parts. Fighting starts in 1927, and then we'll go to about 1937, and then fighting will resume in 1946 through 1949. Now you might be looking at that and wondering why fighting stops. Well, if you think about what we've talked about so far, there's a big moment that happens that's going to affect China, and that's going to be the invasion of Japan, which is going to start, or the invasion by Japan, excuse me, which is going to start um, World War II in the Pacific and in Asia. And so when that happens, uh, the two sides fighting each other, the communists and the nationalists, are going to decide that it will be time to uh, come together, fight off the Japanese, and then deal with their internal problems. Um, just so you are familiar, when we get to the Chinese Civil War, you have to realize that China is in complete chaos in the late 1800s and then moving into the 19. um hundreds a lot of issues a lot of problems going on um and so what's going to happen is that in 1911 there's going to be a revolution that will overthrow the emperor uh that will overthrow the current dynasty uh that was ruling china the problem is this revolution is what we would refer to as unfinished and the reason why is because it doesn't really overthrow the old government it doesn't really get rid of all the important people of the old dynasty and so that's why you're going to have fighting um kind of that's going to occur um even when um this revolution has taken place and again if you look at the timeline here 1911 is when this revolution happens we're not going to see an end or a resolve to the chinese civil war for almost 40 years when in 1949 it's clear who the winner is and it's clear the new shape china is going to take there are two sides fighting in this Chinese Civil War. These two sides are the Nationalists and the Communists. Um, and again, especially for our study of this, we need to realize that these words, although they refer to specific ideologies, are very different and diverse when we apply them. Especially that's going to be the case for the Communism that's going to be proposed by uh, the Chinese Communists. And so you'll kind of get a grasp of that um, as we go through, and you'll see it's much different than the Soviet uh, communism. Um, now, again, what's going to happen here is what is going to occur is that after this civil war is ended, uh, the rule of China is going to be completely uh, different and it will be communist in control. So again, that's what's um, kind of crazy. And so the civil war is all about who is going to be the next ruler, or who's going to be the next leader of China, what is the direction uh, this new Chinese country um, is going to take now that you've overthrown the old dynasties, the old emperors, etc. Um, this civil war is not really like the Falklands War where we kind of say, ah, you know, some political effects, you know, etc. 
um, the effects that a Chinese civil war are massive. And these effects are not only going to be on China. Again, for China, this is huge because what we're going to see here is that the way China goes and the ruling of China is going to go in a completely different direction. This is also going to have a massive effect on the international stage. Again, if you look at the timeline here, 1949, it's the very beginning of the Cold War. And so when China becomes communist, again, spoiler alert, hopefully not, but okay, whatever, um, you have to realize that that is going to create a lot of anxiety for the United States and for the Western powers. And it's also going to give some optimism to the Soviet Union. However, as you'll see throughout the course of this year, that optimism is really not going to last long. Um, so that's kind of an important thing to be looking at. Now, the first thing that we want to look at are the long-term causes of the Chinese um, Civil War and why the Civil War kind of comes about. Well, our biggest kind of start to the Civil War for China would be the late 1800s into the early 1900s when China was being ruled by a dynasty known as the Manchu Dynasty. During this dynasty, life for Chinese peasants was very tough and the reason why i use peasants is because the vast majority of the population were peasants uh, farming out in the countryside they paid an extraordinary amount of money on rent had little to no land high levels of famine all those kind of really really tough stuff um so this is not a good time to be uh, living in china in addition to the internal problems like issues of famine, high rent, and other issues like that, there's also an external problem, and that external po problem goes with the exploitation by the um, imperial powers. Now, if you recall from world history, European powers such as Britain, France, uh, Germany, Russia, even Belgium to an extent, had gone to places like Africa and Asia and basically taking these places over almost directly. In China, it's going to be a little bit different. China will remain independent, at least in name. But in the early 1900s, what we see, and it's what is depicted on the map here, is that these imperial powers have divided China based on what we would refer to as spheres of influence. And so what this basically means is that in their given region, these imperial powers have basically full and total economic control um so even though these are you know chinese resources all the rest of these things these uh countries are taking them for themselves um because of these spheres of influence what it means is that these imperial powers are benefiting and they're profiting but for the chinese these trade deals are awful and these treaties are terrible but the reality is china is in such bad chaos that they're not really in any position to be able to do anything about this exploitation by the imperial powers. Um, what we also see is, again, not only are we dealing with external issues in China in the early 1900s, what we're also dealing with is internal problems. And the current government, this Manchu dynasty, was plagued with corruption, um, plagued with other issues that was making it really impossible to fund money, to be productive, and to really create anything uh, substantial. Now, there was an attempt in 1900 um, to, and this was like a nationalist type rebellion, uh, where a group known as the Boxers rose up and tried to rebel against the imperial powers. Um, however, without modern weaponry, this was largely a failure. This was suppressed pretty easily. Uh, by the imperial powers and so what we see here is that the chinese are not interested in this arrangement but the reality is they have basically no way to get out of this kind of unfair deal for themselves this is a kind of famous political cartoon you might recall it from our discussion of the box rebellion but here we see the various um, imperial powers carving out uh, China for themselves and of course we see China in the background no stop you know don't do that but at the end of the day uh, voiceless and they're not really able to be heard most of the people you see sitting here are kind of the normal culprits when we think of imperialism however there's another country here that's not really interested in imperializing in Africa but is interested in imperializing in Asia and that's what you see 
on the right hand side, which is uh, depicting Japan. And so Japan, as we'll go through this, is really kind of the major enemy uh, for the Chinese as they try to establish their control over uh, the region and their control specifically over China. Um, here's a look at the Boxer Rebellion. Um, again, these guys actually thought they were immune to bullets and other things like that. Again, um, if you think that, that's very nice. Well, not really, but it's just not going to work out very well for you at all. Okay, so let's talk about the overthrow of the Manchu dynasty. Now, again, this is not necessarily part of the Civil War. This is just more part of the long-term story, the long-term causes, etc. So, in 1908, things really hit a very bad point for the Manchu dynasty when the emperor takes over is two years old. And you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, why is a two-year-old taking over as emperor? Well, it's because this is all based on a patriarchal line. So basically the old emperor died um, and the next one in line just happens to be two years old. Again, some of the problems when you have monarchies, emperors, and things like that where things go in a family line, uh, sometimes these things happen. Anyways, with obviously a two-year-old emperor in control, he's not going to be in power. It's going to be his advisors, but this is a big failure. And again, the Chinese peasants, they're looking for reforms. They're looking for land. They're looking to have some comfort of their life. And the reality is that's not going to be happening, especially with kind of the weak leadership uh, that's being undertaken here. So finally, Chinese citizens who are frustrated with the situation that's unfolded will make the decision to revolt. And so what we see in 1911 is what re is referred to as the double tenth revolution. And so what we have here is the overthrow of the ruling dynasty. So the overthrow of the Manchu dynasty, the overthrow of this new, you know, two-year-old emperor. And so the question becomes, what is this new Chinese government or Chinese state going to look like? Again, throughout the history of China, China, it's been dynasties and it's been emperors and things like that. So what is decided is that instead of these dynasties and all the rest of these things, we're going to have the first Chinese uh, republic. And so this is the idea that you're going to have a leader that is not a monarch. And instead you have a leader that's elected and all these things. And that's seeing oh, so nice and, and so great. Um, the first president of China is this guy that you see here. Uh, this is Sun Yat-sen. And Sun Yat-sen was a Chinese intellectual, had a lot of great ideas for the way uh, China was going to look. Um, however, he did not necessarily have enough support in 1911 to cement his control. The other problem is that, again, going back to this idea, this is a very incomplete revolution. Why is that the case? Well, they do overthrow the dynasty, they do overthrow the emperor, but there's no real introduction of democracy. There's also no real move out of your old governmental and your old military leaders. Most of those people are still going to keep their positions and stay in control. And so what you have is this weird kind of in-between moment where you're trying to figure out how to kind of move forward and capitalize on this revolution um, because, again, right now you're in this weird kind of incomplete deal. Because Sun Yat-sen does not really have enough power and because of the importance of at least starting the setups to this revolution, what we see is that the new ruler will end up becoming uh, Yuan Shikai. And so we're going to talk about him. He was a military guy in the old government, and so he is the one that's going to uh, continue to take over um, here in this interim period. Um, here's Yuan Shikai, um, again, uh, an old military guy uh, that's going to be actually the official leader of China. So let's talk about this guy and his rule. Well, unfortunately, if you want to talk about an unfinished revolution, it really comes down uh, to the gentleman you see here. So what happens is when Yuan Shikai takes over, he becomes a military dictator. And so again, if you want to talk about not really progressing or not really making strides towards a revolution, the rule of Yuan Shikai is pretty indicative of that dynamic. What also begins to happen well it already was but 
kind of continues to even become stronger is what we refer to as regionalism. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. But what's happening is the country of China is not developing as one single unit. It's developing as several kind of strange units, uh, very disjointed. And instead of having allegiance to one ruler or one Chinese republic, which is now what this has become, you have allegiance to you know, a local leader and you have uh, allegiance to a local region. And so that's very problematic if you're trying to get everyone on the same page and getting everything together. Um, Sun Yat-sen has not gone away and he really wants to move away from this, but he's not quite there yet. Again, he does not have quite the support yet. Um, again, you still have these old issues with some of the old people in the government, old people in the military, etc. However, Sun Yat-sen will establish a new parliamentary party in this new republic known as the GMD. Uh, for our sake, we'll refer to them as the Nationalist Party, but we'll go between uh, those two uh, words. Sun Yat-sen has three principles for this Nationalist Party, and you see them listed here, but I'll just kind of mention them briefly. The first is nationalism, and what this primarily means is that you have to get rid of these imperial powers and the foreign influence that is still crushing China. Again, even after this revolution, China is not strong enough to get rid of these imperial powers. Secondly is democracy. Again, it should be the people that are able to rule themselves. Now, the problem is, and what Sun Yat-sen establishes, is that at this point, China is relatively uneducated. And so they're not quite ready to rule themselves and rule democratically. But what he says is we got to provide education to establish so people are able to set this up. The last one is people's livelihood. And simply put, this primarily refers to land reform. And again, the peasants were being crushed by high rent from the landlords. They did not have really any say in it. They were paying the vast majority of the money they had towards rent and so the idea becomes okay hey let's give them some land and so they can you know have some ownership in this whole deal all the rest of these things now the question becomes kind of like geez Sun Yat-sen seems to have a pretty good vision why didn't he just take over well the problem is Sun Yat-sen was trying to avoid civil war because he knew that the military was still very, very high. And so in order to get rid of the imperial powers and to ensure that you would have kind of stability in the long run for China, he knew that it was necessary to have the military support. Again, think about when we talk about Latin America, who overthrows the government all the time? It's the military. And so if you have military people in power and military people in control, uh, that's obviously much less likely to happen um however Sun Yat-sen was still pretty suspicious of Yuan Shikai so he kind of uh, moved him to another capital to kind of try to distance him um and what's kind of happened here is that Shikai uh, will kind of mark his own downfall and the biggest reason why is because he is going to uh, declare himself to be the emperor of China and so when he does that and when he as abolishes basically any of the little small um, advances that had made been made towards democracy, um, people were really upset and they said, listen, we just had this revolution. We got rid of this dynasty that we didn't want. We got rid of this emperor we didn't want. And now it looks like you're just trying to um, return to that. And so then all of a sudden he's forced to step down. And so at this point, we kind of have this weird deal where, again, we're in a very limbo type stage for China. And the question becomes, where exactly are we going to go? Here's uh, Shikai here. Now, we're kind of going to move into more kind of short-term causes for this uh, Chinese Civil War. And one of the biggest short-term causes is going to be uh, from regionalism. And again, we've kind of talked about this, but this becomes even stronger after the fall of Shikai. So... Internally in China, you have a very, very distant lack of unity altogether. And so this lack of unity is going to help cause the civil war. And so I'll kind of go through that as, as we move through. What happens is already, as I said before, after the Chinese civil rule, after the Chinese revolution and during the rule of Yuan Shikai, 
we see that China is disjointed. And after Yuan Shikai, there's basically no central power to really try to take this whole place over and really kind of steer them in any sort of unified direction. And so China is going to break up into many of these small little states and provinces. And each of these little provinces are going to be controlled by a warlord. And so what happens here is that these warlords are largely operating their region independently of anything going on with the central uh, government. So that's a very serious problem, and China is very, very divided. The other problem is that peasants will continue to suffer um, under the warlords. Again, these are warlords. As you can kind of see from the map here, um, these warlords were just interested in going to war, and they were interested in gaining more land, and so they were not interested in land reform for the peasants, and they weren't interested in trying to improve uh, the peasants' life, and so again, things are continuing to be kind of insane. What we are seeing, though, is that for ordinary Chinese, um, especially Chinese peasants, we are starting to see an increase in Chinese nationalism, and more and more people basically saying, how can we try to achieve a unified China? What can we kind of do to move that in the overall right direction? So one of the examples that we'll actually see of this taking place occurs um, in what is referred to as the May 4th movement, which occurs in 1919. And this is primarily students um, who will lead a massive uprising in Beijing against the uh, warlords. And a lot of this has to do with actually uh, Versailles, um, which had just been signed, which had given Japan um, some territory in the Shandong province, which you see in the yeah, like purple there. Okay, but anyways, um, the goal here is for China to be kind of reborn and become a strong, independent state. And so that's kind of the idea um, that is kind of moving here. Um, what we also see is that people seem kind of unified and wanting to have China be independent, but where they're not quite unified is what exactly that independent state should be looking at. Um, some wanted to look at Russia and look at their kind of success with the Bolshevik model and this idea of, you know, many Chinese looking at what happened with Russia and saying, geez, that kind of sounds like us. Um, you know, they did something about it, and so maybe we should do something um, relatively um, similar. And so what starts to emerge is you still have the nationalists who, again, are, are still, you know, kind of a clear leading group, but again, not quite strong enough at this point uh, to rule by themselves. But what you also see is another group um, that's starting to come together and become stronger and also represent kind of another idea for the betterment of China and these are the communists. And so originally, these two groups are actually going to be united. Uh, but as we're going to see, that unification and that uniting is not going to last very long. So now it's a good time to talk about these uh, two groups, the communists and the nationalists, that are going to rise in China. And they are going to kind of turn from being somewhat of friends to enemies. Uh, so anyways, let's talk about this dynamic. So first off, after the death of Sun Yat-sen, the new leader for the Nationalists will be Shanghai Shek, which you see uh, right there. And again, same kind of dynamic for the Nationalists uh, as with the case with Sun Yat-sen. Uh, they are the leading group at this point, but at the same time, because of regionalism and because of the warlords, they don't quite have the power or authority to be the ones in total control. Um, at the same time, in the early 1920s, there's a new group that's emerging in China, which is the Chinese Communist Party. Some of the viewpoints of the two groups are similar. However, there are obviously some differences, and we'll kind of talk about those as we go through. Uh, but this idea of ideology as playing a big role into the Chinese Civil War is definitely something that you want to be looking at. Now, in the 1920s, when the Chinese Communist Party originally emerges, there's no quite clear leader. There's a few different people that are in kind of control and exercising their authority, uh, but no one quite in the realm as a Shanghai Shek was for the nationalists. Anyways, in the early 1920s, both these two groups have 
one goal that they both share, and it's arguably their biggest goal at this point, which is the desire for a unified China. So the idea here is to get rid of the warlords and try to establish this one solid unified Chinese state. Um, so because the nationalists um, are not quite strong enough on themselves, the communists just kind of emerging into power, we'll see the two groups form what becomes known as the First United Front. And this is the first united front between uh, the nationalists and the communists kind of coming together. And so um, that's interesting because, again, they're kind of different groups, but this desire to unify China is what is going to unite them. Now, as they are united at this point and they do want this unified China, there is an issue, which is that Chiang Kai-shek is becoming increasingly anti-communist. He does not believe in these communist ideas, these ideas of Marx, and the ideas that have been spread with Russia and the Bolsheviks, and so he's becoming increasingly anti-communist. And so what he's doing is he's removing some of the top kind of communist guys from this first united uh, front. However, he can't quite do anything with them quite yet because the reality is he still needs their support. And so what starts to happen here is that this first united front will be successful in ridding China of the warlords and establishing a single unified Chinese state. Now again, it's not going to be perfect, but at the same time, it is going to be relatively successful. Because of this campaign, the nationalists are going to gain some credibility and are going to be seen as the uh, legitimate heads of the Chinese government. This is in 1928. So now what we see here is that uh, we do, for the first time since the revolution, so it's been about 17 years, do have somewhat of a unified China with a clear leader, which are the nationalists, which in turn would be Shanghai Shek being uh, the one in control. Uh, you see Shanghai Shek here on uh, the right, a military man himself. So, so far, we've been looking at some of the more long-term causes of the Chinese Civil War. Uh, we take some time to look at some of the more short-term causes, like the regionalism, and then this uh, unification of the nationalists and the Chinese Communist Party. Well, our kind of immediate cause into the Civil War is when the nationalists will actually make the decision to attack the Chinese Communist Party. So, first off, uh, we have to realize that even though the nationalists and the communists came together in order to try to rid of the warlords and unify China, once that was done, there was nothing really holding the nationalists and the communists together um, as far as being united. And so really what this was was more so a friendship of convenience uh, than anything else. Uh, what's also leading to this is that you want to remember something. The nationalists have been uh, successful uh, they had been successful in uniting China, but it's arguably to be said that they would not have been successful without the help of the communists. The other thing is that the promise of communist programs like land reform and things had given the nationalists some more support. And so because of that, Shanghai Shek was very skeptical and very nervous and he was very afraid that there was a potential for the communists to become more popular uh, than the nationalists. And so what happens next is that he is going to try to do everything he can to get rid of the communists. So first off, he expelled all communists from the GMD, uh, basically saying you are not in any positions of power. You got basically uh, almost refusing to acknowledge that they were in large part a reason why the nationalists achieve so much success. The other thing that he'll do is what becomes known as the purification movement. And this is when he basically tried to exterminate and kill all communists, union leaders, peasant leaders, and, and things like that. And so at this point, it's very clear that Shanghai Shek and the nationalists did see the communists as being their number one enemy. And with that being the case, uh, the big goal became to completely rid of them. Um, under increasing pressure and knowing that they were not safe, uh, the communists will make the decision to flee to the Chinese city of Jiangxi, 
once they flee there, what we have is the official start to the Civil War uh, once the Nationalists pursue them and basically seem bent on getting rid of all communist influence in China. Um, again, this is going to be the start of the Civil War. So officially by 1928, with the decision of the Nationalists to attack the communists and to try to get rid of them as best they can, um, this is what's going to officially start uh, this war. See this image on the right of the purification movement. So the communists are going to flee to Jiangxi. Once they do, the question becomes what exactly is going to come about? Well, the communists know that they need to retreat to try to survive this massive amount of violence violence that they are now experiencing and so where they flee becomes known as the Jiangxi Soviet. If you remember and you'll get more accustomed to the Soviets refer to kind of like small councils and these kind of govern a place regionally and this was the group that garnered support during the Russian uh, Civil War and that's why the Soviet Union was such a name uh, to honor them. But either way, what's happened here is that basically uh, the communists are confined to this relatively small place, um, just hoping to kind of regroup here um, and survive. But what they know is that right on their track and right behind them are the nationalists who are basically um, have all out orders to try to do everything they can to exterminate the communists at all costs. What's starting to happen is that, again, with such pressing times, we kind of need a leader. And so who is beginning to rise through the ranks of the communists but a man by the name of Mao Zedong? Now, we're going to spend a whole unit on Mao Zedong, so I don't necessarily want to uh, get too much into his background as far as where he's from and all the rest of these things. But he is becoming this big leader in the Communist Party. Now, it's important to realize that many still believe that amidst everything, the only way the communists could survive was if they partnered up with the nationalists. Mao was very persistent in saying that if the communists worked with the nationalists, there would be no way they would survive. And instead, what would happen was they would be um, in a ton of trouble, they would be destroyed, um, etc., now, there's also some things that you also want to realize that make Mao a little bit different than um, other Soviets, especially, or sorry, other um, communists, especially those higher ranked within the Communist Party. Mao did believe in communism and this idea of revolution. However, on an ideological standpoint, he did not believe revolution would come from the industrial workers, which was kind of a tenet of Marxism and certainly a tenet of the Russia case model. Instead, Mao looked at the situation inside of China and he said, look, the vast majority of the population are these poor farming peasants. So they are the ones who are going to be the basis behind the revolution. It is not going to be the industrial workers. And this is actually going to put him at quite serious odds with other higher ranks in um, the Communist Party. Um, there's also other issues, um, in particular the issues of guerrilla warfare. And again, this idea of land reform um, that Mao wanted to put into place. And again, land reform was something that could be agreed upon by most within the communists. Guerrilla warfare, not necessarily, but certainly this idea of revolution within the peasants uh, was not something that was shared by many. The calm in turn, it's basically communist international uh, they're the ones trying to assist in communist revolutions throughout the world, centered in the Soviet Union, are going to be very disagreed with um, Mao and what he has to say about this. Um, he did not believe, sorry, uh, they did not believe in this idea of uh, revolution being based on the peasants, um, this idea of guerrilla warfare, um, etc. So kind of an interesting di dynamic that was going on there. Now, just because the communists have fled to Jiangxi does not mean that they are safe. And so the nationalists are right on their tail um, trying to destroy them. 
Now, one of the reasons they're trying to destroy them is because they know the communists are a threat, and they know the communists and some of their ideas, in particular the ideas of land reform and the ideas of improving life, improving life for the peasants, is becoming much and much more popular. The other thing is that the nationalist government is very ineffective, and this national government is not making really any progress towards democracy, any progress towards land reform, etc., um, because they relied so much on the import on the uh, influence of the rich, this is one of the reasons why they're not going to be very full force. This is the nationalists to institute big time initiatives and big time reforms, um, because again they know that the rich are not going to go for these initiatives and reforms. So, um, in the early parts of the nationalist government, into like the early nineteen thirties. The big reforms deal with things like the building of roads and the building of schools. Again, I'm not saying that's not significant, but that's not really going to fix these big problems that are plaguing the peasants. Again, the nationalists are completely committed to destroying the communists. And for them, they think, okay, we know where the communists are. They're in this one location, so let's try to destroy them. So the best way they think to do this, and again, uh, Shanghai Shek is a military guy, is to encircle them. And this way, if they encircle them, it's almost like a blockade type thing, except not in the water. But what you'll be able to do is cut them off from all their supplies. And so they'll basically be weak um, to get or be able to do anything. Now... The communists know that this is a serious threat and they know that the odds are stacked against them and so they know that they need to build up their own army and so what we see is that the communists will build up their own fighting force known as the communist red army. Again, it makes sense. Communism always associated with the color red. We wouldn't expect nothing less from the China model. However, amidst a numbers disadvantage with the nationalists sending in on some of these encircle campaigns, 100,000 troops, 300,000 troops, 400,000 troops, all the rest of these things, the communists are able to prevail and defeat them. And probably one of the biggest reasons why has to do with guerrilla warfare. Because the communists were familiar with the terrain of Jiangxi, they were able to basically use this to their advantage. What they were also able to do is get the support of the peasants, which meant they could choose the place and the timing of their engagement. So at least for now, they're able to survive. The biggest defining moment for the Chinese Civil War, at least for the first part of the Chinese Civil War, comes with what is known as the Long March. And this is a defining moment for the Civil War, as well as a super defining moment for Mao. So let me kind of explain this. So far, uh, Shanghai Shek and the Nationalists have basically encircled the communists of Jiangxi about four times. And each time sending more and more troops, but each time because of careful strategicness, because of guerrilla warfare, and because of, you know, the support of the peasants, uh, they've been able to survive. Well, the fifth time is referred to as the final time, because at this point, Shanghai Shek basically says... Enough is enough. We need to make sure we completely destroy them. So what he does is he is going to send a huge force. This time he doesn't come with 100,000. He doesn't even come with 500,000 nationalist troops. He comes with 800,000 men. They are also assisted with air cover. We have heavy artillery they bring to the fire, um, etc. And so again, this shows just how committed they are to basically annihilating the uh, communists. Now, because of the way this goes, um, it, it's pretty clear here that um, the communists are, these, the odds are stacked against them and they are going to lose. Many communists in Jiangxi die, and basically you're at a point here where the communists, if they don't do anything, are going to be like sitting ducks, sitting in Jiangxi, Nationalists are going to be able to completely encircle them and basically just completely destroy this place. Now, it's important that you realize that Mao was not a military commander during this final campaign. And so um, 
you know, when this loss ensues, it's not like people are blaming him because he wasn't actually involved. Other higher-ranking communists were. However, Mao knows that this is not a good situation, and he knows that they stay in Jiangxi, there's no way they are going to survive. And so Mao conceives a plan, and his plan is to basically break through the nationalist lines and set up another base. Now, based on the nationalist level of control, this base is going to be relatively far away, and Mao knows that there's a lot of risk involved in here, but at the end of the day, they can't sit where they are now because it basically is going to mean total destruction so what's going to happen is with basically all those that are left there's going to be what referred to as the long march and this long march takes over a year about 368 days and will lead 6,000 miles and as they're making this march as you can see on the map here um it's very long but also they're going through some of the most kind of hostile and terrible territories of China because that's really the only way they're going to be able to avoid some of the nationalist strongholds and so that's how they're going to be able to get there. Now this march is going to lead to a massive amount of deaths. First off you have to first deal with all the deaths that are going to be experienced at the onset as they try to break through the nationalist line. Again many will not survive there but there's also a ton more that are going to die all the way through about 90 percent of the forces that Li jang see on this long march will die however this is still very significant because at the end of the day there are survivors and going to the original plan of mao they are able to establish a new base and so at this point what we see here is that this has been able to be successful uh, they're going to arrive all the way in Shanxi, and so once they arrive there, um, it, it's it's pretty significant. And now they're able to establish a new base there, and now they're able to try to kind of regroup. But at least now they have survived what would have been a massive slaughter at Shanxi. Now, what this is significant for is a few things. Obviously, first off, they survive, and again, there's many moments along the way where they will be confronted by the nationalists, but through uh, Mao and his military leadership and other things, they are able to be successful. The other thing and why this is so significant is that this does officially approve Mao and the effectiveness of his guerrilla warfare and the effectiveness of, of his ideas of Chinese revolution and beating the nationalists, etc. And so what we see here is that because of this, Mao now has credibility and Mao is now going to take over officially uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And so that's seen as a major shift and a big stepping point um, into making this be successful. Again, the map here, wow, this is this is pretty impressive. Um, here we see some of the long marchers. And again, this is a very brutal journey. But at the end of the day, Mao says, this is the only way we're going to be successful. We can't stay here in Jiangxi because if we stay here, we're just going to get completely destroyed. Now, what will kind of take place for the rest of the war is Mao's leadership leading to revolutionary warfare. And there's some kind of stages to this that we'll kind of talk about briefly. But basically what happens is now because of the Long March, Mao is the clear leader of the Chinese Communist Party. And so because of that, he is able to kind of put into place his ideology in specific regards to revolutionary warfare. Now, this ideology, again, goes back to the idea of the peasants leading the revolution, guerrilla warfare, etc. But there's more kind of dynamic uh, mentalities that are going on here. Um, but overall, the biggest idea that you want to be thinking about here is that now what he wants to do is gain more support from Chinese people. Again, based on where the communists are, they occupy a very small base of support at this point in the 1930s. The nationalists occupy a much bigger base of support. So what he's going to try to do is say, hey, look, you got if you're Chinese peasant, you have kind of two options. You can stick with nationalism and you can kind of continue the way things are going. Or you can go to communism. And in the communist model, we're going to have a restructuring of society. 
We're going to have land reform. We're going to restructure the government, et cetera. And again, he's trying to make people realize that, yeah, maybe communism is a little bit of a risk, but it makes the most sense for the Chinese people. Um, so a couple of what Mao wants to do, first off, he wants to set up base areas. And what this means is basically where they already are in support, getting peasants there, educating them in his communist ideology and hoping that this will spread later on. There's also what he refers to as the organization phase. This is where the leaders of the communist party are going to go to other places where the Chinese communist party was not very prominent and not very successful and try to educate them and tell them, you know, about what's going on. The other thing is because there is quite a few villages at this point in China that are pretty spread out, the goal becomes to go there where the nationalists are not in very strong control and try to get their support and then kind of use that to build up and become stronger. Um, you have to defend the bases. The nationalists, although they're a little taken back by this long march, are still on the trail of the communists. And so this is the idea of you're going to defend the bases. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, it's through the next stage. You have to do, through, do so through guerrilla tactics. That's the only way you're going to be able to beat the nationalist force, which is, at this point, is much bigger, much more trained, conventionally at least, but Mao knows something. He knows the area. And he again, he knows that if he can get the support of the peasants, these will help him, you know, be stronger and be more successful. Mao also realizes that at this point, if it's a quick war, then the communists are going to lose. The nationalists are going to win. And so the big thing for Mao becomes, let's have a long war. Let's protract this out. Let's, let's prepare for a long war. There doesn't need to be immediate victory. Let's kind of phase this out and that way we're able to be successful. Um, finally, the, the last kind of phase of this is going to be actually seizing power. But the idea is that you start local, you have your guerrilla uh, units, and they're going to take over their little spaces and their little spots. And then eventually what's going to happen here is that they're going to be able to join together form a conventional army and then move onwards um, and actually be able to be a formidable conventional fighting force and take on the nationalists. So anyways, the last thing that we finish off here is with the end of the first phase of the Chinese Civil War going to 1937. And so, well, here's what happens. By 1937, the Japanese have become far more aggressive. If you remember in 1931, they take over Manchuria. The League of Nations gives that pathetic response. Basically gives the Japanese the green light to come into China, to try to take over and create this big empire. And so because of that, now all of a sudden we need a united front. How could you possibly defeat this very aggressive, very militant Japanese force if you have the two biggest groups within China fighting each other for control. So this is when the decision is made in 1937. Hey, you know what? Let's form another united front. Now, again, this is a beneficial relationship. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. First off, again, as far as fighting the Japanese, you're not going to be able to do so if you're divided. Another reason why this is such a beneficial relationship is that this is going to allow foreign aid to come into China. Um, and this also gives a little more legitimacy to the Chinese Communist Party, who are just beginning to, again, kind of grow in stride, grow in power, um, etc. Now, the next part of this is, is why were the communists able to survive in phase one? And again, as you've seen, most of the odds have been a stack, stacked against them throughout this. Well, the Long March is critical. And again, you have to realize before the Long March, it looked like the communists were going to basically be massacred. Um, however, this allows them to be able to move on and establish a new base, which is going to allow them to reorganize, get everything together, etc. The communists are also able to use propaganda to try to gain support as well as a patriotic victory. Again, communism is a pretty intense ideology it's a pretty tough belief system but the goal here is not necessarily to be 
all intense and all kind of crazy about communism, but what you're able to do is play this as a patriotic victory. And what you're able to do is say, this is for the benefit of China um, as a whole. And you kind of start there, and then you kind of move into some of the more revolutionary stuff, namely with the people who might be opposed to this in the long run. You also want to realize that what we have here is that as well as there being success for the communists, there are also errors made by the nationalists. Um, for example, the nationalists are still never able to quite get the peasants on their side and support of the peasants, which again is a huge error. They make up the vast majority of the country, and so that's a serious issue and a serious problem. Um now, at this point, and also, again, um, because of not being able to ish deal with the peasants, the nationalists never really institute the reforms that were being sought by the vast majority of the population. Now, at this point, what we see is the Chinese Civil War take a little bit of a break. Uh, this break will last till the end of World War II until the Japanese are defeated. And so, at this point, now we see a little bit of a, a break and it's on to fighting the, J the Japanese. However, what happens with the fighting against the Japanese will have a significant impact on the direction of the Chinese Civil War. Anyways, hopefully this first part gave you some good knowledge as to how the first part and first phase of the Chinese Civil War goes. Um, now that you've done this and completed this, uh, make sure you solidify your notes, see what's going on, and then you can move on to the next video and see the conclusion of this epic battle. Thanks a lot. See you soon.